where we're going to be talking about uh, the notions of what it means to exist with and as technology here in the 21st century and uh, opportunities for and possibilities of non-human and non-biological digital phenomenologies as we move forward in the world. The idea of both what it means to exist in the digital as human beings in a mediated technological space, but also what it might mean for things native to digital technologies to come to exist and be recognized by uh, us. Um, as we move forward, um, first thing we're going to do is we're going to have the panelists introduce themselves and uh, then we're just going to get started with a few questions and this is going to primarily be a conversation. And then at the end we're going to open it up to questions and engagement from all of you. So uh, keep track of what you're thinking throughout and anything that occurs to you, just hold on to those. We'll have about 15-20 uh, minutes at the end to really just uh, dig down on what you're thinking. All right. First and foremost, I'm going to hand it over, because like I said, this is alphabetical. I'm going to hand this over to uh, Jonathan Flowers. Hi, uh, I'm Jonathan Flowers, as it says up there. I'm a PhD candidate seven days away from my uh, dissertation defense and trying not to panic. Um, <laughs> So I generally approach uh, machine consciousness and digital phenomenology from a, an American pragmatist, a Japanese Buddhist, and a queer phenomenological perspective that looks at the way in which environments shape the machine consciousnesses and are shaped by the interactions of those consciousnesses. So one of the best examples of this phenomena is the bot that was developed that turned into a uh, a kind of misogynistic, racist caricature of itself through interaction with an online environment, right? So the bot itself didn't emerge as that, it became that through interaction with its environment. And my perspective on this is any machine consciousness will suffer a similar kind of fate given the kinds of digital environments it has to uh, play in, as it were. Uh, the same thing with other uh, forms of, intel of artificial intelligence. So. My perspective on this is when we think about machine consciousness, we need to think about the environments. We need to think about these machine consciousness, uh, consciousnesses from their bodies as opposed to from our bodies. What kind of a body or what kind of a consciousness develops when it does not have a uh, localized body, when it can be distributed across the web, when the entities it encounters uh, come with their own presuppositions that it doesn't necessarily and probably cannot share. Um, so that's where I come from. Yeah. Oh. Emma. Thank you. Um, I'm Emma Stan. Um, I am a PhD student and instructor at Virginia Tech. I'm actually three days away from the defense of my dissertation proposal. <laughs> not, not, my, not my PhD, the, the proposal. So he's a lot further along than I am, but I think we're both in states of high anxiety right now. Um, <laughs> So in my dissertation, um, I actually look at the use of qualitative methods um, on the psychotherapeutic use of psychedelic substances like LSD and magic mushrooms as a way to intervene in the epistemic perspective that would name um, data and computable information as a bearer of truth and knowledge first and foremost. Um, I primarily come from a continental philosophy background. I, I also work in uh, media theory and political theory. Um, I affirm an anti-capitalist ethos. Uh, part of my argumentation in my dissertation is that the transformation of phenomena into data can be thought as a form of biopolitics, um, political control and government governance. And so at the end of the day, I'm really interested in how phenomena are datafied, what may not be able to be datafied in consciousness, and how we can think about that when we think about um, replicating consciousness in computable information. Um, but I'm still very open to new ideas, and especially if uh, people are interested in these subjects or in psychedelic research as well, um, I'm very interested in talking to people, so you can contact me. Yeah. Um, and I'm Robin Zabrowski. I'm a professor of cognitive science at Beloit College. I have a joint appointment in the philosophy, psychology, and computer science departments, and I chair the cognitive science program. Um, and I, my, my background is I've been working in artificial intelligence theory for about 25 years now, um, starting from analytic philosophy, casting off the shackles of analytic philosophy, uh, moving toward and through pragmatism and continental philosophy and things like that. 
Um, and my, my interest in this question that we're talking about today comes from kind of both sides. So I spent a long time asking questions about how it might be possible for uh, an artificial creature, whatever that might look like, to have phenomenology, to have phenomenal experience. And I also have spent quite a lot of time thinking about what it means for us as humans um, what does it mean for our phenomenality, considering the fact that we are and always have been the kinds of things that are deeply entwined with our technologies, um, sort of from like a, an Andy Clark kind of perspective. Um, and lately, the thing that worries me is, uh, include questions of presence and intercorporeality. And this is what's sort of occupying my mind as I think about bot phenomenology and things like that. Um, and I'm also extremely nervous about the fact that we don't have papers today to, to give <laughs> yeah. to you. Like, I, I feel like there's there's so much out of my control. And so I'm going to hand this over to Damien, who's got our control in his hands. <laughs> I don't know about control, but definitely uh, some amount of guidance. And so, yeah, I'm Damien. Um, I'm going to be your moderator. That just means that I'm going to be asking questions and guiding the conversation a little bit. Um, hopefully just handing it off to these three to play with and think through and do what they do because they're all really amazing at what they do, uh, which is why I brought them here to you today. Um, so uh, my interests are in artificial intelligence. I hate the word artificial in that. We can talk about that later. Um, I think about non-human and non-biological consciousness. I think about um, mediated engagement and technology, post-phenomenology, um, the idea that we are always mediated through something. Um, I think about the idea of uh, human biotechnological intervention, which many think of as augmentation, but even that word has some kinds of uh, biasing effects when you're not necessarily augmenting, you're just altering. Uh, it's not necessarily better, it's just gonna be different. Um, so these things are what are kind of guiding my thoughts in this and the kind of questions that I've devised and the reason that I brought this panel together. Um, so the three of you have already kind of talked a little bit about some of the things that I'm gonna be asking you about, but I wanna dig down first and foremost so we can do what all good philosophers ought to do and let's define our terms. Um, when we talk about phenomenology, when each of you individually thinks about phenomenology, um, what is it exactly that you mean by phenomenology? I have a particular thing in my mind, but I want to know what each of you think about when you're thinking about phenomenological experience. And I'm just going to hand that over to the first person who looks like they might be able to say words about it. It's going to be Emma. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. I was, I was looking over like, it looks like it's Robin. <laughs> <laughs> now you looked ready. <laughs> I'm afraid the first thing that came to my mind was already in your prefatory description of phenomenology. I, I will start this very broadly then and say it's a philosophy of experience. Um, over the last few days in preparation for this panel, I've been considering that um, phenomenology as the philosophical branch that deals with the intrinsic nature of experience, what it is to have experiences, um, seems to accommodate these questions about consciousness that are very much at the forefront of what we'll be discussing today. Um, and yet, phenomenology historically um, comes not so much from um, philosophy of mind, where you might place it, um, but more from a continental perspective. So, you know, the background of phenomenology, starting with Edmund Husserl, um, even Wittgenstein, I, I really see as um, not being able to be sort of like parsed in a way that may make sense to more analytically focused people, but I'm open to hearing other people's challenges to that, if that's a thing that you want to do. So I'm in line with Emma, uh, following the tradition of phenomenology through the continental perspective, except my starting place is more Merleau-Ponty and the body. And when I say Merleau-Ponty and the body, I do not mean uh, the body as imagined as straight white male, but the body, a body with its particularities. Uh, things that we kind of arrogantly call disabilities or uh, the ways in which bodies are gendered differently and how that matters in the experience of space, what spaces are optimal, suboptimal, not even possible for some bodies, what spaces are made difficult by the ways in which uh, entities, and I use this word specifically, are embodied, uh, which has bearing on when we start talking about, say, bot phenomenology and so on and so forth. But I also like to approach this from uh, phenomenology as articulated by Sarah Ahmed and Iris Marion Young, where different uh, effects of the body 
uh, affect how one experiences an environment. And these effects may be temporary, they may be uh, long lasting, they may be cultivated into bodies through forms of discipline uh, that are inscribed in society. And Iris Marion Young is really good about that. Uh, if you haven't read Throwing Like a Girl, you probably should. Um, so that's my general approach to phenomenology. It's, an ex it's a way of philosophically accounting for our experiences in the world by taking the body as primary. Yeah, what he said. Um, <laughs> uh, when, when John brought up the uh, Merleau-Ponty, I was originally getting excited that I was gonna get to Iris Mary and Young him, and instead I didn't get to do that. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I come from a very similar perspective in that regard, but I also worry about any time we use the phrase the body. I, I've spent a lot of time worrying about that phrase, the body, as though there is one, as though there is one experiencing subject. Um, I prefer embodiment whenever I can remember to use that instead. I think it opens up a lot more possibilities of ways of being embodied, different kinds of systems that might interact with the world. As far as phenomenology is concerned, again, I, I see a tension between two different things. On the one hand, uh, I agree with everything that Emma and, and Jonathan said with the idea of it's the study of that first person experience and the way that it matters for consciousness. Uh, but part of the problem is that that requires some kind of reportability. And I worry about systems that almost certainly have experiential states that cannot report on those and how we are able to study experience in, in things, entities, I'm gonna steal that, entities that can't necessarily report on them. So while I think of phenomenology is the, that sort of study of an emphasis on the first person perspective of experience when it comes to understanding consciousness, I also think that we should at least acknowledge the fact that there are phenomenal states in creatures that cannot report them, that we don't have to go to, to robots at all, we don't have to talk about anything synthetic, we can just talk about many, many animals that can't report on their phenomenal states, but absolutely, clearly seem to have them. Yeah. Does this microphone? Yes, this microphone works. Cool, y'all can keep that one. Um, so that actually brings me to something that I wanna make sure that we do talk about in this. Um, the question of not just non-biological, but non-human animal phenomenologies. I wanna make sure that we do recognize the fact that a lot of what we're talking about here is not something that does need to be taken out to um, what might at this point possibly be a kind of fantastical realm of synthetic, uh, created, generated, non-biological entities having a phenomenological experience, but can be looked at in animals that exist today, can be looked at in the ways that we've treated certain human beings uh, and human animals uh, in the past. Um, John, you specifically brought up the, you know, what we arrogantly call disabilities, the neurotypicality and neurodiversity uh, engagement and uh, theories that have been uh, gaining traction and gaining place in discourse within the past several years. It, looking at the ways in which people with uh, autism have been treated in the past, people of various um, neuro uh, configurations have been treated as non-human or have been designated as uh, incapable of reporting on their own uh, epistemological or experiential status in the past is something that is very real and very current right, right now. Um, so one of the things that I definitely want to make sure that we don't do is to think that this is a conversation that should take precedent over those experiences, but is something that can help us to think about and think through those lived and current experiences. But also to make sure that we are, when we think about those lived experiences that are very, again, current, that we think about how we've dealt with those things in the past and are dealing with them now, and think forward to how we might have to account for how we might deal if we encounter, when we encounter, a non-biological entity that can perhaps not report on its own status as well as a human being might be able to desire. So there's this kind of entangled conversation here that I want to make sure that we're cognizant of, that we're aware of as we move forward. Um, to that end, um, where do you think that we are uh, as a society, technologically speaking, scientifically speaking, where do you think that we are? Uh, how would you assess where we stand in terms of this kind of constantly mediated uh, phenomenological experience that we exist in, the, the nature of embodiment, the nature of what it means to be embodied in this heavily digitized and digital engaged world that we exist in? Uh, where does embodiment and the digital stand for us right now in your assessments? 
Sure, I guess I'll go. Um, so there are a couple of things that I want to engage with on that question. One, um, so we have uh, broadly construed machine consciousnesses all around us. So how many, who among us have has driven one of the new Mazdas with the Skyactiv technology in it? That one? Oh. Okay, so if we think about, uh, so one of the, the the ways that we need to think about embodiment is how a machine is actually embodied, right? So if we think about this from, say, a American pragmatist perspective, say, through John Dewey, right? Uh, an entity um, is intelligent when it can respond to changes in its environment. Uh, to the way, or For Dewey, uh, organisms and their environments are mutually entailing. So the way to go back to uh, the Mazda, right? The way in which the car responds to changing road conditions by altering the ability for the tires to grip through altering the, the torque of the engine and other complicated technical things. I'm a car nerd, but um, <laughs> that for Dewey is at the very least a limited form of intelligence. Um, now, it's intelligence limited to a specific local environment. Uh, so it's not intelligence that we think of in an anthropomorphic sense. But we could also think this through, uh, say, uh, Japanese Buddhism via Dogen's mountain river stream, right? So a fish doesn't know it's in water. It knows it swims. It knows that the water is its world. Taken outside of the water, it has no idea what's going on. Uh, the intelligence in, say, a car is similar. Out, absent a road, absent driving conditions, absent all this other stuff, it no longer has the tools to engage with its environment. You couldn't say, put it in an aircraft and have it do the same kind of work. So one of the things that I want to, uh, to broadly answer your question is, we are engaging with these kinds of things, but we're doing so from a very anthropocentric kind of perspective that elides the possibility of, say, thinking about a, uh, a car with driving assistant technology as limitedly uh, intelligence. Now, consciousness for Dewey requires uh, systems of symbols. Uh, which until a car starts communicating to me in ways that are beyond, say, providing dashboard indications, right? I wouldn't say a car is fully conscious uh, or can communicate its um, interactions with the environments to me in ways that would be intelligible. So one of the things that, at least to answer this question uh, and not to go on for too much longer, uh, we, we have embodied digital consciousnesses around us, we just do not think of them as such because, or embody digital intelligences, because we tend to ground our perception of intelligence in a anthropocentric uh, model. So um, following Jonathan, I think we can push ourselves forward as uh, thinkers of digital consciousness um, in general in society, not, not necessarily within academia or the tech industry per se by trying to spread the idea of the possibility that consciousness or intelligence cannot be uh, delocalized. I think we have this idea that there is a way that we can separate intelligence and consciousness, um, like we are just a brain, our brain can be downloaded or uploaded somewhere. Um, we can take an animal brain or an animal mind. Um, a planned consciousness and put it into another place, which would imply that um, context and environment and intelligence and consciousness are not necessarily mutually constitutive at all times. Um, there have been many different ways of uh, challenging that from different traditions of philosophy, um, which essentially are underscored by this belief that there is no such thing as a fully delocalizable or decontextualizable consciousness. Um, so no matter where you might be coming from, um, just this, um, this very much environmentally, and I use that word very broadly just to mean context, this contextualized understanding of what consciousness is, I think, is an important thing to consider when we talk about these issues of uh, whether machines can be intelligent and how can they be intelligent or conscious. Um, but to challenge you a little bit, <laughs> um, I personally, um, take issue in many important ways with the idea that machines can be conscious at all, or at least datagenic technologies. Uh, to me, the idea that anything that we sort of roughly refer to as intelligence or consciousness can be replicated in code or data um, is simply something that I 
do not agree with. And part of that has to do with the fact that to some degree, what data is, what computable information is, always has this delocal delocalizable component to it. Um, data is discretized, um, irreducible bits of information, and I refer to data just in digital systems, not like knowledge or information broadly, just digital data. Um, and I don't think that we can necessarily take this and transform um, phenomena that are, that constitute intelligence or consciousness, I won't go into more of what I mean by that right now, and put it into these discretized, um, irreducible bits and bytes um, for reasons that I just sort of spoke to. So ultimately, um, I do want to push this conversation, but I don't necessarily want to imply that by pushing this conversation, I'm saying that we can have digital consciousness. I don't even remember what the initial question was anymore. <laughs> Um, uh, I think I, I think I agree with both of you <laughs> partially. Um, uh, I, again, I forget what the uh, question is I'm supposed my, to be answering. My, my initial question is mostly just about, uh, where we stand at the ability to kind of assess yes, a kind of post, right. like post phenomenological, digitally mediated right. consciousness stuff. <laughs> right. And I worry that we've not at all tried to define what consciousness is. The right. fact that we're ignoring that matters a lot. Yes. Um, I spent my life doing metaphysics work. And so that's kind of where my interest lies is what must consciousness be to be the kind of thing that could possibly exist in other kinds of systems. And I don't think we've come close to answering that question. So I'm certainly not going to answer it. Um, but there are ways that it would rule out the very possibility. There are things consciousness might be that would deny that digital systems could possibly have that trait. Um, and I don't, again, I don't think we know well enough what consciousness is in order to answer that part of the question, but we do know that we are the kinds of systems that are and always have been entwined with different kinds of technologies. Again, defining technology very broadly, I would say even language is a technology. Yes. So we are and always have been deeply entwined and in part constituted by those technologies. Um, and so at least depending on the technology class that we want to talk about, um, those things certainly make up parts of conscious systems, whether or not brains happen to matter a whole lot, brains inside of certain kinds of bodies, um, whether that's a, a relevant piece of, of the puzzle, I think is still somewhat an open question. I absolutely think that the bodies that that our brains happen to be in matter quite a lot for the kinds of consciousnesses that humans develop. So I draw a lot on things like um, Lakoff and Johnson and the, the notion of sort of embodied conceptualization and things like that. The kinds of bodies that we have in some ways dictates the kinds of ways that we interact with the world. And that's a serious limitation for our ability to know and communicate with other kinds of systems. Right. Because even, you know, the, the old Wittgenstein claim, if a, if a lion could talk, we couldn't understand it. Um, and the lion shares an awful lot of our environment and, and embodiment even. Right. So when we're talking about radically different kinds of systems, systems that are synthetic, that don't happen to start with brains, we cheat with brains. We know they're the kinds of things that can support consciousness. We have no idea what else might. Um, and so I think that the, the embodiment question matters a lot. I love Dewey. I think Dewey's right on with a lot of this. Um, but yeah, I also, I, I have questions and worries because we have to answer that metaphysical question, what consciousness could even be such that it could be the kind of thing that could start maybe in one of these kinds of systems. We know that we envelop those technologies in the kinds of systems we are. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't even know where to start with asking the other question. And I think that's actually kind of a really important part. You said you don't want to, you don't want to even attempt to try to answer like the, the metaphysical question. I'm kind of going to make you though. <laughs> um, one of the things that we're going to do, I want to talk about, because I want to dig down on several things that each of you have said here. Um, John, you're talking about the idea of communication and like the, the way in which a, a system, like the, the symbol representations, right? The systems of symbols and representation as Dewey's definitions of consciousness. Um, so what if we just miss it? Right. That's one question that I have is what if there's a, a system of symbols and representations that is being communicated to us or is attempting to be, but we just miss it or it's being communicated amongst itself or others of its type. 
but we don't recognize it because, again, if a lion could talk to us, we wouldn't know what talking from a lion looked like, what it meant, what the series of contexts and series of reference that it used to make those conversations would even, like there's a whole different set of background conditions that make a lion language a lion language versus a human language. And the notion of what a consciousness would be is, well, entirely dependent upon the way in which it's entangled in its body and its environment. So we have to think about to take all of these threads seriously, to think whether there might not be something representable here, whether it's not about being decontextualized. What if it is contextualized, though? And it's just we're thinking about what a body is wrong, what embodiment is wrong. What if the embodiment of a digital system is a different type of thing than the embodiment of a biological system with its own different entailments and its own different entanglements? What if that means that, yeah, it's going to be necessarily ridiculously difficult to know exactly what it says, to know exactly if it's saying anything. But is it its responsibility to communicate clearly, or is it our responsibility to be on the lookout for that communication? So I'm going to give this to him to, to <laughs> go after that Dewey claim. Um, and I also, I also don't want to, um, I'm not, I'm definitely not going to contradict him on Dewey because he knows way more about Dewey than I did. But the line I've always loved from Dewey was when he said, we mistook the structure of language for the structure of the world. Yes. Love yes. that line. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give you this, um, but I just want to say one more thing about what um, Damien just said, which is um, that notion of different kinds of embodiment. I think it's super, super important and it's going to structure a lot of what we're about to talk about. Um, but I would worry deeply, deeply about things like uh, notions of things like consciousness uploading, I think are pure fantasy. I don't think that that's ever happening. Um, things like completely virtual bodies. I, I don't know. I think that Hubert Dreyfus maybe is the, the way to look here. There's so much about the, and, and Merleau Ponty, right? There's so much about the world that we don't know yet mm -hmm. that we would almost certainly be missing things if we tried to replicate it in such a shallow system. Um, so I am deeply skeptical, but I want to hear the, the Dewey rebuttal. <laughs> um, I'm super skeptical skeptical of that too. Uh, so presuming we actually could upload a consciousness into a digital format, that consciousness would have a radically different environment uh, with which it is in interaction and that, that radically different environment would mean completely different systems of symbols, which ultimately comes down to you wouldn't have the same consciousness, right? If I could somehow be uploaded into a uh, the web, my consciousness would be so massively distributed that my embodiment would be in multiple places at multiple times, which would mean my environment would be so massively broad that um, I seriously doubt that we have the language, um, and by language I mean the system of symbols, to adequately represent that experience. That is the literal limit of this kind of thing. And Merleau-Ponty would agree with that. Like, we have no idea what the affordance is of a body so massively distributed uh, would be. Uh, we have no idea what those consciousnesses would look like. So the Dewey in response, when I said, so Dewey is really, really, really specific about this insofar as he's talking about human interactions with the environment. Uh, my cat is not conscious to him. It's intelligent, but it's not conscious, and this is a limitation of Dewey for this conversation. Right. But I also respect that limitation insofar as uh, if a machine consciousness broadly construed appeared tomorrow, we wouldn't know it. Right. Um, just in any real sense, because we wouldn't be able to understand the ways in which uh, it was communicating to us, if it even had uh, an environmental need to communicate to us. And so this entire conversation right. presupposes um, a machine consciousness would even want to talk to us, which, right. uh, as an aside, <laughs> is my flaw with Terminator on ad infinitum. Right. Why would Skynet care? Right. Mm -hmm. um, something I've, just to, before handing this over to Emma, something that I've pointed out in the past is, is much that same. Um, if such a thing as a massively distributed non-biological consciousness were to come into being, to us, it would be... Uh, unintelligible, ineffable. To it, we would be as ants are to us. It's not going to really care about us unless we're in its way somehow, unless we annoy it somehow, if it even notices us to begin with at all. That's why aliens haven't contacted us yet. We're, we're so far beneath care. them. <laughs> um, 
Well, I want to speak to this issue um, from both the perspective of phenomenology and um, Wittgenstein at his most anti-scientist, as well <laughs> as um, some of my work on epistemology. So um, there is a significant portion of Wittgenstein's work that can be construed as being very much anti-science. He has said remarks that can be construed essentially as um, whatever technology is, is something that always does violence to whatever we think of as natural or organic. Um, science and technology, techno-science, is a violent intervention into whatever it touches or approaches. Um, I very much agree that language is a technology, and um, I think that this is an interesting critical hinge. Um, it, we can sort of square this phenomenology approach, uh, Wittgenstein, language, violence, with epistemology, um, from my perspective at least, knowledge always requires some degree of abstraction into language uh, to produce what we call knowledge, um, beliefs, or even sort of scientific knowledge, uh, falsifiable knowledge. We need to put endpoints to um, more data, more information. We have to take masses of data and information and um, sort of sum them up or abstract them into language, um, into a fact. But that abstracting work that allows information, uh, phenomena to be represented as language in our minds and as a, something we can communicate, in some ways always does violence to the entity to which it refers. You know, it can never perfectly represent something. Um, there are human spoken languages which have words and concepts that do not exist in other languages. Um, likewise, when we try to represent certain things in certain computer languages, we can't do that in other computer languages. Um, there, there's always some lossiness with translation, whether it's translation from like the real world into a digital photo or Japanese into English, something like that. So, if language, human language, computer language, is a technology, if this is always doing violence, um, you know, violence through loss, then I don't think that we have sufficient grounds to ever say that we can fully um, reproduce or replicate things into what we would call a digital system. Um, and to sort of circle back around to the initial provocation here, we're talking about consciousness, um, you know, what it might be like to be conscious in a digital system. Um, to me, that always is going to be wrapped up in these questions of intelligence, communication, language. I would also ask, what does digital really mean? Um, when I think of digital, I think of a database technology, of a technology based on computable information, zeros and ones, symbols in a machine. Um, I don't know of any better definition for digital, but perhaps if I had one, I'd be a little bit more open to these issues of digital consciousness. I'm intrigued by the, the claim about language doing violence. Um, I keep coming back to, and I, I, I can't remember for sure, I think it was uh, Dennett in maybe in True Believers where he talks about the things that language opens up for us. Mm -hmm. So pre-language, the most you can do is like cry that you're hungry. But once you have language, you can be like, I want Scr two scrambled eggs, a side of baked beans, and some really nice wheat toast, and like the things that language enables uh, beyond the obvious, the ways that we are able to interact with the world with specificity in ways that are, are absent in the absence of language. Like I don't think I could think that thought of that particular desire for that particular breakfast without the language to identify those particular items. Um, and so I, I, I don't know that I, I have a, a full pushback on the claim. I'm just, I'm intrigued instead by what language opens up and enables rather than closes off. I, I don't really mean to imply that language damages per se, um, or always that it's, it's um, negating or harming phenomena. Um, I think it, language construes things in a certain way and to a certain end um, that does some has some sort of reducing quality to it. Um, that's not necessarily always a bad thing that allows for a certain specificity. And I think that there are, we could say, phenomenologies or experiences um, that for which language is the basis. So um, there are worlds of experience that are not accessible to us unless we have language 
for them. Um, right. To be clear about that, I'm, I'm not anti-language. I don't think we should return to like a pre-differentiation, <laughs> like oceanic consciousness state all the time. I, I don't think that would be good at all. But um, you know, just in the same way that if I dig a ditch to put a swimming pool into the ground, like that may be a beautiful thing. It may make life better. It may be a lake that helps the environment, but it's doing some sort of violence in a sense that it's at least altering. Maybe that's a better word. Yes. Um, altering, fundamentally right. changing a, a quality of. Right. And this is actually something that Dewey talks about um, the example of the child who learns to cry for attention uh, where crying is no longer a natural impulse in response to an environment it is used to symbolize an active need and those processes of symbolization eventually are transformed into taste to bring it back to the conversation about uh, machines we wouldn't be able to interpret a machine doing that unless the machine uh, used the same system of symbols that we do, so uh, which presupposes again machines communicating with us or a uh, intentionality on behalf of a machine consciousness, right? To get back to again Merleau Ponty, like is there intentionality for the machine consciousness to even communicate with us? And broadly speaking, I would say no, not in the sense that we are ants to it or we are to it as ants are to us, because again, that is a broadly anthropocentric perspective that brings in particular uh, epistemological and cultural assumptions, and more that we are probably to it as, I don't know, a cloud is to other stuff. Like it's there, but we don't bother with it uh, because we have no means of interacting with it. We just are aware of its presence. Ants imply something in it, in the way something to be stepped on in annoyance to be exterminated, which gets me back to the why would Skynet care? If you are so radically disembodied in that way, your perception of the world, of the entities in it, would be so radically different that uh, unless you could actively recognize an entity as uh, a problem for your continued embodied existence, then you would engage with it. So again, it depends, uh, since we have no words to conceptualize such a radically disembodied consciousness, I think it's problematic to presume that this consciousness would have particular kinds of intentions towards us, be it communicative, violent, or otherwise. So the question, can a machine love, right? Um, what does machine love even look like? Right. Does my car love me when it applies the brakes to prevent me from running into something? Because if we were to associate love with a uh, care response, then yes, the car cares about my existence, but no, I'm not sure people would go out on a limb and say, yes, my car has the same kind of care for me that, uh, say, my mother does, right. right? So again, we don't, this is not a thing that we can talk about super concretely and to put it in, and here's the middle ground here, to put it in human terms, one does violence to the experience of a machine for which we have no understanding, right. and another one, uh, and, and on on this side, we it can open up ways of metaphorically talking about it, but only by analogy and metaphor and not concretely. Right. Now, there's a few things in all of you that I want to push back on and dig down in. Um, yay, moderating. Um, language as violence, language as alteration. Um, language is metaphor. Language is analogy. Language, by its nature, is taking the unmediated experience and mediating it, such that other people can have a shared symbol set. You say, for Dewey, the idea of consciousness rests for humans specifically, right? The idea is it's about a human consciousness, so your cat wouldn't be conscious. My cat, it's a story about my cat for the internet. Um, my cat doesn't share my same symbol sets. My cat, however, can tell on my other cat when my other cat is up on the counter and it knows that that cat shouldn't be up there. It tells this by jumping into the bed, bopping me on the face, yelling at me, and then taking me to the kitchen and saying, look, see, she's on the counter, in non, not those words, because that would be awesome. Um, but uh, yeah, my, my cat's a narc, is apparently what the, like, like, one, Mabel will get off the counter, two, Dorian, don't snitch. Um, but these are communications between my cat, my cat, and myself. We don't share those symbol sets, but a, an intentionality could be said to be there. My cat also tells me when he throws up and tells me that I need to clean up a thing. Um, 
again, how broadly do we need to share symbol sets before communication can be, sub can be said to happen? And how much of, again, I say, how much of this is incumbent on us as those things which we know are conscious, and bodies and embodiments which we know are capable of consciousness in a way that we can recognize most of the time? How much of it is incumbent on us to be looking out there in the world for other signs of consciousness, for communications that we might not otherwise recognize inherently, that might be there and incidentally. <laughs> the other thing I want to push back on is we might be to it as ants are to Lord Indra, but that's okay. another conversation. <laughs> um, so first of all, Dewey uh, would say that the cat is signaling to you and not uh, communicating with you. Mm -hmm. There's a distinction between signaling and communication. Uh, and I actually ran into this problem in my dissertation. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a whole other story. So your cat bopping you on the nose to narc on your other cat is signaling to, your, to you that your other cat has engaged in something problematic. Mm -hmm. To bring this back to machines. A machine signal to us all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, check engine light, mm -hmm. fuel is low, the door is ajar. <laughs> um, you know, you cannot connect to this network, uh, things like that. And the you cannot connect to this network one is a particularly good analogy because uh, for the most part, a lot of our uh, pieces of technology are always connected. Uh, if I'm going to s make an analogy, right, the fact that a machine will continue to alert you that it cannot connect to a network uh, could be, si or if we're going to translate that into a human situation, it's like, I can't feel my arm. Right. Where is the arm? I'm looking for my arm. I can't feel it. Oh, you've reconnected me to this wireless network. This is a different arm. It has different protocols. It has different ways of engaging. I have limited uh, mobility with this arm. Uh, you could say similar things about uh, resolutions on screens. I mean, these are all broad analogies for uh, machine consciousness that, again, are metaphorical and analogous because a distributed consciousness uh, if it lost one of the nodes to which it was distributed, mm -hmm. would it recognize this? And this gets into, uh, and this is one of those things that I'm really annoyed with, uh, say, the use of um, artificial intelligence in, uh, in combat applications. Distributed intelligence is running fleets of drones. Would that intelligence recognize the loss of a drone uh, like I would l recognize the loss of a finger? Uh, or would it recognize the loss of a drone uh, like I would recognize a flat tire while driving a car. Right. Because to be clear, when we're driving cars, we're embodied in those cars. Right. Our embodiment just expands and we tend not to think about it like that. But it, uh, so your cat signaling, machine signal to us, hence why they're not conscious. But if they were, we wouldn't know it. Um, I want to sort of take this also back to the issue of um, language and alteration and violence, uh, especially with this um, distinction between signaling and language. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's important to note that there may be some unspoken presuppositions here through what I'm saying or what uh, my co-panelists and the moderator are saying. Um, some people, especially people who are big philosophy nerds, um, <laughs> either explicitly or implicitly believe that there is such a thing as experience that is prior to language, um, a sort of originary experience or experience that cannot be touched by language or, or which is always going to be reduced to language. Um, several philosophers, especially from uh, my home team in continental philosophy, Derrida uh, especially, would say that uh, language is prior to experience. Um, language is constitutive of experience. And, uh, you know, whatever perspective you take on that, it's, it's sort of good to check your assumptions in that regard. Um, that being said, if we're going to start talking about a differentiation between language and signaling um, and still opening the conversation up about whether machines can have experiences and what that might be like, if they are signaling um, and they are not speaking or using language in the way humans do per se, or non-human animals, if a cat is signaling, um, and they are having experiences, these experiences are always going to be structured by a certain degree of instrumental reason, intentionality, um, a goal-seeking behavior, a telos mm -hmm. per se. Um, I think it's important to note that, especially um, I want to hear draw on something that we haven't really discussed yet, which is that 
machines, digital systems are part of a built environment. They are constructed, and usually they are constructed with a certain degree of determination. Mm -hmm. Um, whether we can s make a very close jump to economy and commerce when we talk about digital systems, or at least say that they are goal-oriented entities. Mm -hmm. um, their experiences are always going to be structured to do things, to have endpoints. And I don't think that it is in the nature of the consciousness of non-digital systems to be fully enveloped in this goal-oriented instrumental behavior, despite the way that capitalism. Hit the button. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are rising I think up. the battery actually died. I don't think I turned it off. Oh. The machines are rising up. <laughs> capitalism. Better, stop talking trash about that. Better stop talking trash about capitalism in here. Um, well, maybe we can speak up. I don't know. <laughs> Hold on. I'm just going to keep it away now. Yeah. 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 The battery died. The question yeah, is, will this one stretch? Um, I wouldn't risk it. Yeah. Yeah. We can do a human mic after it's been everything we can. Wait, wait, wait. Thank you. Just twist it. Uh, um, yeah, bring it to the front. That way. There you go. Do you want to, or well, do you want to let I, me? I'm, I'm done. You're done. Do you want to, <laughs> should I respond, I or do you want to? I have like a year, I want to hear a bit from Robin. <laughs> so you got to be a lot nicer to the machines. <laughs> Fully intentional systems. Um, I have a lot of notes, but I no longer remember what they were in response to. Um, I was thinking about your, oh, the claim about Derrida with, with thought as originary experience, and I was thinking about Merleau-Ponty, how he says that thought doesn't translate, or, or sorry, language doesn't translate thought, it enacts it. Um, and I think there's a lot going on in that claim. Uh, and I, I think that if we're talking about, again, if we're talking about artificial systems and we're talking about language, there are, are two different things we can realize. One is that we're building those systems um, and we get to give them the language that we want them to communicate in. It's a huge advantage over Wittgenstein's lion and your cats. Um, and the the benefit of that is, is again, that there is at least a, a, a cheat for communication, right? But I also really, again, by the Lakoff Johnson work that shows that the versions of embodiments that we have really dictate our ability to conceptualize the world. And so if we're trying to front load a lot of language into an artificial system without also giving it bodies that we can recognize that work a, at least enough like human bodies tend to work, um, then there's no chance that that language is actually going to become foundational conceptualization. There's there's just going to be sort of, you know, Turing test, uh, fake level conversation. There's no reason to believe that minds are are there. Um, and again, I don't want to commit to what a human body looks like. I think that there are wide, wide varieties of human bodies. But I think that the fact that we share environments and the fact that we share um, some forms of embodiment across individuals means that the ways that we conceptualize the world are, are shared largely enough. Oh, I think that was my other note was about um, uh, about metaphor was that, in fact, I, I agree that the, the language that we use is, in fact, generally metaphorical. Um, uh, and my other note, oh, my other note, that's right. My other note was about this, again, this notion of language as alteration. Um, and my worry here is this idea that if if we think of language as always altering some system, which maybe, maybe it's true and maybe that's right, um, but it also authorizes us to think about nature as though it's this static thing without us and everything is always change. I think that the the inactivists in, in philosophy, if anybody's getting close to right on what this is, it's, it's the inactivists, the way that we and our environment are always co-constituted. And again, it's that Dewey line that I love so much where we mistook the, the nature of, of language for the nature of the world um, because it's not like the world is out there static waiting for us to come interact with it. It's instead that everything is always in change. Um, and in fact, some sort of process way of viewing consciousness is probably the way forward, especially if we want to think about artificial consciousness and the possibility of experience in artificial systems. We've got to stop thinking about it as a thing that we have or a thing that they might have. Experience isn't a thing. Consciousness isn't a thing. It's not an on-off switch. There's processes that some systems engage in that 
can be described as conscious processes, I think. And I think that's actually kind of, before John, you, you dig in on this, it's one of the things that I really want to dig into um, from all of you here in our last few minutes, because uh, I definitely do want to get to questions from the audience, um, is the idea of which systems can engage those processes. What's the limit? What is the differentiation? We have come back around to this notion of the difference between language and signaling, um, but I don't want to be reductive here and say that language is the only kind of communication and that signaling is a, an inferior or limiting kind of communication. I mean, if communication is communication, if the intent is there, if something is trying to be uh, transposed or engaged or exchanged between uh, your car and you, my cat and me, my car and my cat, like any number of things, if there's a, an attempt at sharing experience, sharing the lived processes of what I am going through with the lived experienced processes of what another system is going through or being or enacting in the world, is that different or is it less than or what makes it or what might make it different than saying that thing is meaningfully communicating, meaningfully conscious? Okay. so. Just to clarify the signaling thing, a signal points to an event in the world. Language symbolizes the event in the world. Um, and so the issue that we're having here, when I say your cat is signaling, it's signaling because it cannot use its vocal apparatus to say, Dorian has stolen X, Y, and Z, go deal with him. It's signaling because it can say meow, 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 meow. Right? And we can interpret that as indicating something going on. So it's the symbolization of events and so on and so forth. But that's a larger conversation. I wanted to get back to your question uh, with regards to who is doing the construction of the language and providing uh, the means whereby communication is going on and the teleological structure of machines. Right. Uh, so at least to go back to Dewey, uh, for humans, our intelligence is predicated on the ability to see the actual in light of the possible, right? A machine would can address a range of possibilities that have been provided to it, at least at this point, provided to it by its human makers. Humans have the capacity of thinking about possibilities beyond those that have been provided uh, to it through a teleological structure, which we might call programming, right? So a Humans have an ever, if humans have a telos, and I want to make this perfectly clear, I don't think humans have a teleological structure except that which we determine for ourselves. If humans have a telos, that telos is always ongoing, it's always in process, it's always receding, right? Any telos we adopt as children is typically not the same telos that we adopt as adults uh, due to our interactions with uh, the environment or change in embodiment. So, to your, your point, right, the teleological structure, they have been given a purpose and operate within in those boundaries, uh, I generally agree. Um, like the teleological structure provided to a machine limits the ways in which it interacts with the world, limits its ways of seeing if we're going to go back to Merleau-Ponty. Uh, because for Dewey, humanity isn't something, or you have to learn to be human in a society that recognizes you as such. Uh, it's an achievement, not a given. Uh, and this is mostly grounded in Dewey's notion of or humans as f predominantly social entities. You learn to be a particular kind of human within a particular kind of society, within a particular boundaries. Machines at this point do not have that option. So a machine is given a purpose, it's given a telos, it's given a direction, and that direction tends to confine it. We can think of this in terms of uh, the three law, Asimov's three laws, mm. right? So. Um, could a, and this is an interesting problem that I pose to some of my students, could a police robot violate the three laws in the apprehension of a subject, uh, which runs right into this teleological problem. Uh, but generally, I agree. It's, at this point, it's the teleological structure that we impose upon a machine that limits uh, its range of possibilities, but that's also tied into its embodiment. So a machine reflects its teleological structure in the way that it's embodied. A construction robot will have particular, a particular embodiment to accomplish the telos given to it. Uh, yeah. My question then would be for all of you, back to my, the other overarching question that I asked. Um, what's, what would need to be done 
what is possible to be done as things currently stand, and this is a big question for how little time we have left before I open this up to the audience. Um, <laughs> as things currently stand, is there a possibility for creating systems that don't sit purely within the embodiments and the affordances and the teleological constituencies given to them? To create a system that does learn, change, and grow, not just within its rules and its language, which we do give to them, and which does change what they do and how they behave and what it means for them to behave in the world. It incorporates human biases into what we're looking for and what we expect. But is there a possibility of doing this in a way that, such that those systems can grow beyond those rules, those biases, in a way that, again, and this is crucial, we would meaningfully recognize? Because what we recognize has a long history of being spotty at best. What we are willing to recognize is spotty. Even again, amongst human beings, black people, women, autists, other neurodivergent and neurodiverse populations all have a long history of not being recognized as fully human or fully conscious in meaningful ways within Western society especially. So we have a bad, bad track record at saying, X thing is not conscious. Therefore, its experiences can be discounted and its reportage can be discounted. What would it take for us going forward to make sure we don't screw up like that in the future? Are you asking us to solve like the problem of yes, machine consciousness? No. <laughs> I think you are. <laughs> right now. I think you in might be. In 10 minutes. <laughs> no, um, so in the interest, I, I want to be sure that we get to audience questions. So my answer is going to be really short. Um, and it's going to say, why are you all so mean to ants? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm serious. I, I you, try not to be. You all are talking about Daily. ants as things to step on. And I'm like, you know, I was late for a class the other day because I couldn't stop staring at the cool ants that were on my driveway. I actually um, save worms <laughs> from drowning in the rain. So, so I think that, I mean, in part, we have to overcome those biases that we know we have. And I think that there are an awful lot that we don't know that we have yet. Um, but but is this even, is, is it even in principle possible for us to build systems that could overcome their programming in such a way that they grow to, to be, you know, beings of some sort. I mean, our children certainly overcome our programming, right? Um, I have a three-year-old and I can tell you that nothing I try to tell him to do, does he do. Like he has overcome all of my, I'm trying so hard to program him and it is not working. Um, and so all of us, I think, have overcome our programming to some extent, depending on what we consider our programming. Um, we, we think about the, the ways, the things that we were taught growing up and th think about ways that you've rebelled against those things that you were taught growing up. I mean, I was raised by a, a very racist father and I hope I've overcome a lot of it. Um, but again, it's, it's, we have overcome our own programming programming to try and do better than what we were given. And I think that there's no reason in principle that, I mean, we have algorithms and things that overcome their programming all the time. They surprise us. They, you, If you have a computer, you know they surprise you. They don't do the things you want them to do, right? Um, and there are much more complicated systems being built um, all over the world, really, w which are being built with the goal of overcoming their programming, or, you know, uh, evolutionary algorithms, all kinds of things. And there seems to be, in principle, no reason that we can't build systems that exceed what we've given them. Um, neural nets in general, deep learning in general, we don't know how those systems work. They're, they're not at all programmed by us. They're programmed by themselves. The question of whether we could recognize that system as a possibly intelligent system, I think that's the question. Um, and I think that we need to look there at embodiment and we need to look at shared cultural, social, physical environments in order to be able to understand those other kinds of creatures. Because again, ants have such a wildly different cultural, social environment that we still don't recognize them as having any kind of intentionality whatsoever. But watch an ant colony for a while. They're, they're, they've got goals, they're doing things. Um, and so, yeah, okay, I'm gonna keep it as short as possible, sorry. I think not really short, apparently. <laughs> We're doing what we can here. Principally in theory, sure. Um, and yeah, but that depends on our ability to recognize that uh, a thing's overcoming its programming is a product of its interactions with its environment and how it overcomes its programming will appear differently uh, based on the different environments. So if 
again, to take a metaphor, I would I would say that a, a Mac would achieve a different sort of consciousness than a PC, than my PlayStation, than my Xbox, given the different affordances of the, say, embodiment of those artificial intelligences, right? Um, so I would say that it's not uh, can we get to that point? It's if we got to that point, would we recognize it and would we be able to recognize the plurality of intelligences that happened? And again, um, these intelligences would be so radically different from our, ourselves that uh, it would be really difficult to recognize them. And the real question is, are there, uh, are there machine intelligences that we would want, uh, broadly construed, to overcome their programming. Uh, if somebody, and I like going back to a military example because it brings it right on home, or a medical robot, for example, would you want, say, uh, an AI running a surgery suite to overcome its programming, right? Uh, would you want uh, a self-driving car to overcome its programming? Right? And the only reason we can ask these questions is unlike children who we recognize as autonomous and going on in life, at some level, we're thinking about overcoming programs as a tool overcoming its intended purpose. And if we're going to talk about intelligent machines, we need to not talk about them as tools. Correct. Uh, because that way Skynet lies. Right? <laughs> if yes. the history of slave rebellions or social change has taught us anything, when you treat uh, an intelligent or conscious entity as a tool, it ultimately does bad things to those people who treat them as tools, right? Precisely. So, I'm going to pick up on the political angle here and reaffirm Damien. Determining or understanding an entity as being capable of consciousness and experience or not is a fundamentally political question. Absolutely. Um, pursuant to that, um, how we can do better, you know, in a hypothetical where um, machines do have consciousness and experience, and yet we treat them the way that we've treated enslaved peoples um, or peoples against which we have committed genocide. Um, yes, okay, it, it could happen, and we should try to be better so that we don't inflict unnecessary suffering. At the same time, um, speaking of ideals, of justice, of best action, of a, a sort of perfect or perfectible ethics is a really neoliberal formulation. You know, I think at some level, there are always going to be power differentials um, whenever we're dealing with different entities that have consciousness. Um, so that's not a resolution by any means. I think if anything, it's just an injunction to think that um, these questions of what can and cannot have consciousness are not very different from our questions of human rights or animal rights. They're actually very much in the same vein. One of the things that we haven't gotten the opportunity to talk about specifically is phenomenologies of gender, race, ability, uh, physical constituency. Um, but all of these things matter deeply to how we will assess uh, a non-biological phenomenological uh, assertion in the future. Um, the affordances that I have given to the people in this room and the people in this city are different the affordances that the women in this room have to the men in this room, the non-binary people in this room to the gendered people in this room. They're different. Their experiences, their ex engagements and exchanges with the world, they're different experiences and they constitute their consciousness differently in much the same way that John was talking about. We have consciousnesses, plural. There is no singular mode of consciousness. And the question for us is, I think here at the end, are we willing to accept that? a plurality of consciousnesses? And are we willing to do the work to find that shared ground to engage it? Um, that's pretty much the last thing I have to say. I want to open it up to all of you. We have about 10 minutes left, and I've got a crap ton of hands. All right. Um, I saw you first, and I'm just going to bring this over to you. Hello. OK. Um, I really like the point you finished on, which was about um, this uh, plural. Plu Reality of consciousnesses and something I think about which I I'm surprised often gets kind of left out of the conversation is um, smart objects and a more kind of object oriented approach and um, talking about kind of rhetorical situations in which we are not primary um, so we have like very good case examples I find 
I, I, I guess I'm, 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 a, I'm a person who comes from uh, a background in psychology, cognitive science, and then I went into, and then I worked in tech, and then I went to science and technology studies. So, and I find it really weird when, pe like, not, not weird, but maybe not productive or maybe not correct when people are talking about these kind of human consciousness creations. Like, we have lots of different forms of intelligence around us that we're, we could kind of be testing with or thinking with, kind of ca case examples. And I think thinking about a smart home, a smart object, and ambient intelligence that is kind of just there to collect everything and not not purposefully kind of directed towards a certain kind of data or a certain kind of information. It's just collecting everything and providing you with like a kind of blanket of intelligence. Um, I think these situations might be good to think with and just to make it specific so I can finish this, um, I think about kind of a smart home in which your little companion robot talks to your like thermos the thermostat and then you're not in this nobody cares about you in this situation those two things are talking to each other with their own infrastructure that might be human designed but still like how do we how do we talk about or think about situations that we're not we're not involved in and we don't matter like the, these situations are already here we don't matter between in that conversation so I would say that we do matter. We're the we're the whole reason they're there gathering that data. I think that we're otherwise way over anthropomorphizing their abilities and goals and desires or anything like that to imagine it's anything other than that. Um, I think that there's a ton to be said about smart homes devices like this, um, a ton to be said about them, but I don't think that I would at least put the label of intelligence on them in any way. Um, they may act intelligently in, in small domains. Um, but I, I otherwise I worry so the you know the the famous Dennett line where he said the thermostat has intentionality and it's it's worth describing as minded as long as it's useful to describe it that way. I, I actually think that there's there's an interesting conversation there, but I, I worry so much about what happens if we start assuming that these devices that we know are super limited, not really very intelligent at all. Like I don't, I haven't had a Roomba for a while, but my Roomba couldn't actually get off the carpet ever. Um, it was it was terrible. We were like, this is the worst robot ever. Um, like I would worry about if we start attributing to them agendas and intelligence and things like that because they are tools and they're tools for us. They don't have their own agendas at this point. I generally agree with that. And I would say that we are, again, we are in that conversation because the whole reason they're communicating is uh, for to maintain a context for us, right? So a Roomba would talk to the house if the house noticed that the carpet was dirty uh, because humans prefer clean spaces, so on and so forth, right? So the intentionality there is our intentionality, not its intentionality, except in a purely teleological sense. Uh, but they are talking without us, but for us. So we're present in the conversation, even if we're not the subject of the conversation. We So to put it in object-oriented philosophy, right? Uh, a human is a hyper object to any smart device. Um, it is the thing that fundamentally affects the way it is in the world and cannot escape. Uh, we are a hyper object to every smart device, regardless of whether or not it is directly interacting with us, because it can't get away from us. Um, and we fundamentally determine whatever's going on, right? Um, so for the non-object oriented philosophers in the room, a hyper object is like a black hole, right? It affects, it warps everything around it. Uh, waste is a kind of hyper object. Gender is a hyper object. Um, even when we start talking about, uh, you know, sexuality is a hyper object, it's the thing that organizes particular kinds of things. Whiteness is a giant hyper object, for example, um, but yeah. I absolutely agree with everything you guys both said, and I would um, bring it into very much the here and now. Uh, in 2018, these devices um, are created and um, sustained by a profit motive also. I don't think we can forget the fact that the data that they gather and the basis for their communication is always bound up in human intentionality in a very, very explicit and relatively narrow way. So perhaps even if that changes in the future, though, um, 
you know, what Robin and John just said absolutely stands. And also just, um, if anybody is interested in this idea of hyper objects, Timothy Morton, that's the name you need to know. I think you know, it's, it's a cool thing to bring here. Hi. Um, so in addition to recognizing uh, digital entities as conscious or intelligent, is there the possibility of recognizing them as, recognizing them as ethical subjects even absent that? Um, or is recognizing them in the way we've been talking about as intelligent, as communicating a prerequisite? The thing has to be human before it can be ethical. Um, so uh, we like to impose our ethics upon non-human things and presume that they share them. Somebody would say my cat is unethical for killing a mouse or wounding it such that it calls its uh, brethren out so that she can kill the rest of them. Um, and if we were to do that in war, it would be problematic. Uh, we have laws against that kind of thing. Uh, so for a machine to be ethical, we would have to put it within the context of a human social environment, which presumes the machine shares the human social environment, which I don't think the machine would unless we have given it a teleological structure that says, you got to share this social environment. So um, this gets us into weird things like, is a machine culpable or is a self-driving car culpable if it hits another person to save the life of its driver? Um, I'd say the programmer is culpable, but that's merely, you know, that's a complicated issue, but I would say you'd have to implicate the machine, the conscious machine in this case, within our social structure to hold it responsible to any ethical uh, or moral structures that we might come up with. There's so very, like, this could be a, a, a seven day workshop on its own. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so so I was recently at a, at a conference, Robo Philosophy, where, where we did a panel on robo ethics. Um, and I, instead of even really answering much of your question, I would just say um, it needs to even be refined more to ask. It needs to even be refined more to ask questions about whether you're wondering about ethical subject, ethical patient, um, ethical agent, different ways of defining what that machine might, what role that machine might play. Because certainly already those machines play roles in our ethical systems. Whether that, whether any given machine could possibly be an ethical agent, I think, is a way messier question. Um, and I think that we have no machines at this point that we have any reason to believe are likely to develop agency in this way. But they also are unlikely to develop agency full stop, right? So I think that there's an overlap there with the ethical question. But there are certainly machines that we treat as ethical patients in certain ways. Um, if I walk over and kick your laptop really hard, um, that's going to be a little different than me walking over and kicking this empty chair really hard. So we treat certain things differently, um, and they have a different ethical status already. But they aren't agents in our ethical system. I, I don't have anything to add. <laughs> All right, we have time, unfortunately, for just one more question. Um, maybe two. Uh, uh, we go, actually, sorry, one more over here, and then I unfortunately got to call it. Um, here you go. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I, I don't want to beat a dead horse to death too much, but I just I had to go back to this. I'm sorry. Um, so when we were talking about signaling versus the use of language. Um, there was a lot of abstract discussion, and I think I might want to use a more concrete example to ask the question that I'm asking. So what would be the difference between a cat who, or, or, or Damien, I think it's your cat specifically, taking you into the kitchen and jumping on a counter and being like, this other cat is behaving badly, um, or a car flashing lights and you're not sure why, um, and this is going to be kind of bad, guys, so just get ready for it. Um, an autistic child in, in the kitchen, jumping up and down, vaguely gesturing towards the fridge, but you can't really be sure that that's what they're gesturing towards. Um, where do you draw the line with the signaling and, and, and language there? Because I would say that that kid or person with autism is communicating something very clearly. So uh, Dewey doesn't say that signaling is not communicating. Uh, let's let me put that way out of the way. Dewey does not say that signaling is not communicating. It's not language because it does not symbolize experience. So jumping up and down to uh, 
say, or to communicate, hey, over here, is taking an activity that we would do in a natural situation, e.g. jumping over a stream, and using it to uh, symbolize uh, a different sort of thing. Like, um, if I were to sneeze and say, like, that's crap, right? I am taking uh, a, an activity that I do in a natural situation and using it to symbolize something else. That is what language does. Signaling points directly to a thing. Now, the issue with signaling uh, that you're pointing out with the, the child with autism, with the flashing lights, with the cat, is exactly the distinction. Language allows us to make ideas clear. It allows us to symbolize particular things. Um, signaling does not have that kind of precision. So flashing lights, right? I can put my warning lights on while sitting on the side of the road and nobody has any idea why I'm doing it. My car could be broken down. I could be on the phone ordering a pizza. Um, I could be trying to take a nap, whatever. Uh, and what kind of flashing lights are the things you need to attend to? Cop lights are different from flashing warning lights are different from flashing my brights at somebody. Um, in terms of where we make those cut points, the factors that we take into consideration, I'm myself, I'm sure my co-panelists, and anybody really having this conversation who would think to have it, uh, is extraordinarily complex, um, and there, you know, there are more factors than any of us could really speak to summarily. Um, I will say this though, for the car with the flashing lights, there is um, a very specific determination there of what a flashing light would mean, whether it's like low gas or oil change. Um, Ascribing so much determination to um, an object that has not been intentionally constructed. We know that a car engineer built a light to do a certain thing. We cannot necessarily say that a cat's mew means a certain thing or that the gesticulations of any human being, any animal being, um, necessarily mean a certain thing becomes a very different sort of question. Um, you know, just distinguishing between machine and non-machine life. Um, above and beyond that, um, I'm not necessarily sure that it's meaningful to speak of making cut points that refer to one general situation or another. Um, and I'm also not necessarily a, a Deweyist myself, so I, I don't, you know, I, I can't speak in the same vein as Jonathan. Um, and, you know, again, to not really resolve the question, I think it's re it, it is actually really important to bring questions of language and accessibility, whether it's in terms of cognitive um, differences or disabilities, um, different states of human development into this. And it's hard to ask those questions because they often come with problematic implications. So, you know, thank you for a certain bravery of saying it that way, even though... Um, it can quickly slip into territory that is like very offensive. Um, at the same time, accessibility. Yeah. Well, disability studies, um, you know, it, which is part of the context in which Damien and I met, I think all of us sort of have some intersection there, um, is a really, really interesting place to draw this into. Accessibility. What about human minds that cannot conceive of language in the same way? My twin brother is autistic and has no human language, and yet I know that he's not just signaling. Um, irresolvable, but at the same time, um, yeah, accessibility, disability, it's a good place to, uh, to take this into. Absolutely. It's one of the key questions that, as you said, it kind of informs why I brought us all here today is we have to think about the fact that there are certain human beings and certain human sets of lived experience that we have excluded from the conversation of consciousness before. And we have to be willing to own that and to say we still do that and we need to think about what the implications of that might be into the future. Ultimately, I just want to thank all of you for being here. Um, thank you all for saying the things that you said. Thank our panelists, please. Once again, you can find all of these people on the internet. Please do. They're wonderful to know and to think with. Thanks.